Hi, I'm Jen Drummond. Welcome to my podcast, Take a Break. Take a Break is about enhancing and preserving the greatest asset you have, you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Today, we have Gretchen Rubin on the podcast. I'm sure many of you follow her. She's amazing. But to give you a little background, she's she's one of today's most influential and thought-provoking observers of happiness and human nature. She's the author of several blockbuster bestsellers, including Better Than Before, The Four Tendencies, Happier at Home, I'm reading this off The Happiness Project, and her books have sold more than 3 million copies in more than 30 languages. She's also the host of the wildly popular Happier with Gretchen podcast. She has a highly engaged audience across many social platforms. Um, She was clerking for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor when she realized that she really wanted to become a writer lives in New York City with her husband and two daughters. So one of the things I think we share in common is our curiosity about human nature, right? Why do people do what they do, their transformation, how they change, what they change, what they don't. And so starting with the back of the book cover, um, bring me to that moment when you said, I'm going to leave this job and go into something entirely different. How was that? Mm. Well, it was, uh, you know, I, one of my favorite things about myself is I'm sort of uh, subject to epiphany. Um, so I, and, and, and really what got me to switch um, was, a, was a very inconspicuous moment. I was clerking for Justice O'Connor, as you said, and I asked myself a rhetorical question, which I often do. And I was like, well, what am I interested in that everybody else in the world is interested in? And I thought, well, power, money, fame, sex. And it was like power, money, fame, sex. And it was this, it, I just became enchanted with this as a subject, which to me felt like one giant subject and kind of four different elements of it. And I was just doing research and research and I was staying late at work and I was working on the weekends and I was just doing all this research and note taking, which is something that I do often. Like even when I was eight years old, I would get really intensely interested in something and take notes on it. But at some point it occurred to me like, this is the kind of thing a person would do if they were going to write a book about it. And then I thought, well, maybe I could write a book about it. And that's really when I started thinking about leaving, you know, being a lawyer to start being a writer. And it was less about wanting to leave law and more about really, really wanting to write and not even just write generally, but to write this specific book, which I think made it easier because it was, it's much easier to go somewhere where you know where you're trying to get to. Um, I think sometimes people want to change and they know what they don't want, but they haven't figured out what they do want. So I think for me, it was great that I, I, you know, I I decided at a certain point, well, I'd rather fail as a writer than succeed as a lawyer. So I just need to take my shot. Um, And so that, that I think made my switch easier um, than for some people to switch where it's not so clear where they're going. Right. But from the outside, how did people that you told respond? Because mm. that was, you had a fantastic career going. And so yeah. I just know when I've made changes in my career, it's made sense to me, but to the people around me, they, what? It just, it, it was an interesting switch. Yeah, you know, I'm really fortunate in that the people closest to me are very, very tolerant of, tolerant of risk-taking. And, um, and, and that matters to me because I think if they had been very discouraging, you know, and sometimes people are discouraging out of the deepest love. Like they don't want to see you fail. They don't want to see you get hurt. They don't want to see you take risks. Um, and so they want you to do what seems to them to be the safest path. Now, the fact is nobody knows what is safe. So it's kind of an illusion to think that, well, if you stay as a lawyer, you're, you'll be, that's a safe career. It's like, well, maybe, but maybe not. Um, but it was certainly a more obvious path. As you say, I had like accrued, accumulated all of these, these credentials. Um, but I was really lucky because they they were all very tolerant um, of, of risk. Um, and, and my father actually said something to me that to me was incredibly reassuring. But when I repeated it to people, they felt like it was a little bit undermining. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is not undermining at all. He said to me, look, darling, you might not hit it out of the park the first time, but you'll get there. And people said, oh, well, this meant that he didn't believe that you could succeed. I'm like, no, he's saying to me, you don't have to see right away for this to be the right decision. He's saying like, you don't have, it's not all staked on like one outcome. That was very reassuring to me because he's like, if this takes a while, like 
he says, yeah, this may take a while. And the thing is, sometimes things do take a while. So I found that to be immensely comforting um, once I decided to make that change. But I was very lucky. People, people were very much like, okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's see. You know, well, and you yes, had passed, yes. right? You've driven careers to a point where you got success. So I'm sure your past is, well, let's see what she does with this because she's right. had success before, right? Which helps definitely. Yeah. 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 And helped. what amazing words from your father, especially yeah. coming right. Our dads make such an impact on the things they say and how they show up in our lives. Yeah. I mean, my, and then my father gave me some like a related, gave me some great advice as a parent. When my older daughter, I don't know, was like, you know, entering young adulthood, my father said, well, you know, at a certain point you have to switch from being an advisor to a cheerleader. And it sounds like maybe you're at that point. And I was like, wow, that made it very clear, right? Are you an advisor? Are you a cheerleader? And my father definitely was like, hey, I'm here as a cheerleader. It's not for me to advise. Ah, what a gift. Amazing. Right? Yeah, I'm I really love it. Fortunate. I love yeah. it. So, and when you, so your first book that I would say put you on the map, not your yeah. first book, the first book that we all fell in love with you for is The Happiness Project. And you said that you know, it's kind of an overnight success, but really you had been doing it for 10 years. You had three yes. books before. So, yeah. so I think that's important happens. to say, because a lot of times people look at you, you hit us at that tipping point and then you forgot about all the stuff before the tipping point. Right. Right. And, and um, I have three failed novels that are locked in a, in a desk drawer. I have like so many things that never see that, that don't even succeed enough to fail. <laughs> right, know? right, 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 yeah, right. There, yeah. Well, and I think a lot of times when we think of people that are excellent in their field, even look at Beethoven, not all of their songs were amazing, right? right? No. We remember a handful of them that built their credibility and their reputation, but that's the beauty of art is yes. we write these books, we create these things, and not everything resonates with everybody at that time. Well, 100%. And in fact, research shows, and I think it's, it's just very backed up by experience, is that the people who are the most successful and kind of the most eminent, they, they have the most failures as well. That creativity is kind of like taking a lot of shots. Um, and that sort of the more you create, you get more hits because you hit, get more bumps. Right. Um, and, and I remind myself of that often, that a lot of it is just is just product, it's just putting it out there. It's just, you know keep it coming, keep it flowing. Um, I also feel like then the stakes go down. If you, if you do fewer things, then they have to be amazing. If you're doing a lot of stuff, you're much more tolerant of risk or certain, like, cause sometimes things are sort of not successful, but they have the seeds of something that can work. And so by just sort of, you know, um, putting stuff out there, I, I do feel like it, in the end, it, it, it leads you to do better quality work, even though you might say like, but I'm doing so much mediocre work. It's like, well, that's, that may be part of the process. Right. I did the um, journaling project once called the artist way. It's oh, a 12 I did week that. program. Yeah. And I, one of the, what you're saying just reminded me of one of her stories of how, when you journal every morning, you would look at it and you'd have kind of, I would have garbage on the first page. It would get better as I went on. And she's, explained it as just allowing things to get out of the faucet, right? You got to clean yeah. the faucet out. It's yes. a little, right. Great and, metaphor. Yes. Oh, I love that metaphor. Cause anytime I need to sit down, I'm like, okay, I just got to let all this other stuff run out of my head and then the good stuff will come. So it's okay. Yeah. Just keep going. But right. yeah. yeah. So when did you know that the, once the, the happiness project published that, oh, wow, this, this changed, this is a different story. This is going big. That's a great question. I mean, it, it hit the New York Times bestseller list right away. Right. Um, so that was huge. Um, that was, that was huge. And um, how do you celebrate that? Like, what did that feel like? It's kind of out of body. It's a, it's a very weird thing. I do remember, I remember most clearly finding out that I hit number one, which was not the first week, but the second week I was in a hotel room. I was getting ready to do an event and my editor called and I was like, you know, you know, when you're like, do I have time to take this call? Like, what do I do? Cause I was like, I have to leave in 15 minutes. Um, but I was like, okay. So I took the call and she's like, and she has, she was like, Gretchen, 
you're number one. She said it in this like whisper, like, oh my gosh. And I was like, this is amazing. But then I had to go do this event. But <laughs> right. then I said to the event, oh, I just heard and everybody was really happy for me. So that was a very dramatic moment. Um, so yeah, that, I think that that was the dramatic, that was the dramatic moment. But of course it's, it's one of these things where it's, it's like all the work has been done in advance. So in a way it, it almost, it's it, it it feels um it feels like curiously out of sync because kind of my work on the book had been finished for many many months of course because it had to be published and distributed and all that um so it was exciting that all of a sudden it was i could feel it sort of uh emerging into the world in a very kind of tangible way which a lot of times with books there's um what what did somebody say uh about pub day that it's like the most it's like the most nothing day because it's like it's to you it's a huge date but nothing there's a sort of change in the world so right so that was right. very exciting yeah no i get it i'm even so i'm wearing a special t-shirt for those of you who are watching it's got a smiley face on it that's oh yes that. it does look at that wonderful <laughs> yes i'm like oh i was listening to you and your sister banter on a podcast the other day and you're talking about smiley things i'm like i'm wearing my happiness t-shirt because this reminds me of the whole book and everything oh wonderful but, yes that's so great yeah, it's cute. Um, did you ever have a moment that you were thinking, okay, I don't want to write it. I don't, I need to do something different. This isn't working out the way that I had planned with the no. writing. No, no, I no. never had that feeling. No. Yeah, no, I, I kind of feel the same way when I fix on something, I enjoy the journey of it so much that the outcome is just, oh, what did I learn? How do I keep yeah. refining and how do I keep getting better at whatever I'm working on. Yes. Well, and I do think, um, I think this is true for many writers and I, I actually think it's true for many people in many, many professions and, and maybe in professions where you might not imagine it. There, there's almost a compulsion to yes. do something where you, you really feel like you almost have no choice. And in a way that's very comforting because you're like, well, this is my fate. In a way it, it can feel sort of like, I think sometimes people don't necessarily want to do what they feel compelled to do, or, or for some reason it doesn't really make sense for them. So I think they wish that per, maybe they could ignore it. Um, but if you have that very, very strong um, drive, it is very hard to ignore. So once I sort of saw my path in writing, um, it's never, it's never seemed to me um, to be something that I would, uh, I would choose not to do. Now, one of the things that's different is because of, you know, all the change, like there's so many ways to reach an audience now. There's so many ways to communicate ideas through words. So definitely now I have a podcast and I do social media and YouTube and all these things. And so I, but for, for me, that really is still writing. It's just about how do you communicate a different medium words. for it. Right. Yeah. So it's exciting to have, it, it sort of gives me more variety than just like sitting and typing words, which is still my favorite thing to do and what I spend most of my time doing. Um, but it is nice to have these other ways to communicate. My sister, Elizabeth, who's my, the co-host of the Happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast, she's a TV writer, a showrunner, and we both enjoy like using words together, but in this way that is a little bit looser and more playful than the in, like incredibly precise way that we use it in our in our writerly jobs. Right, 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 right. No, your podcast is super playful. I love the relationship that you both oh, have. And it's just, it's a, it's a fun to see a sibling relationship out loud. Does that make sense? You know, I have siblings and it's just, oh, these are normal things or it just normalizes what goes on behind the scenes. And I think that's one of the gifts that your book books give to all of us is we all have different challenges. We're all different. We're all yeah. striving to be better. And really it's about learning yourself yes. to set yourself up for success. Yes. And I think you put your finger on something that I think so many people skip over, but it's actually essential, which is to say, what is true for you? And I think sometimes people want like, well, just give me seven bullet points on a one pager that I can download from the internet, you know? And it's like, well, your happiness pro project and my happiness project would be different because you're different and I'm different. We have different interests, different values, different temperaments. And so you sort of have to always begin with yourself. Like, Am I a morning person or a night person? Do I like abundance or simplicity? Um, is travel important to me or not? Um, you know, I mean, it, it just, I, I think that we really have to begin with self-knowledge. You can't just jump over that step and do like what's the best thing to do um, because there is no best way. Um, it's right. what works for you. Right, right. And that, so I just feel your books give us a framework, right? Of, mm. oh, here's a way to question or here's a way to approach it. And now notice 
here's how I show up in that framework. Here's how that feels to me. And here's how I have to, like the little tiniest thing of how you word something mm -hmm. depends on who you are, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm jumping yeah. around because I've read all the books and I'm in love with all of them, but I, yeah, my, okay. So with, let's start with the happiness project, which was amazing because it was so simple, mm -hmm. right? It was rinse, wash, toss out what doesn't work, repeat. Yeah right? And yeah. so you took on a different challenge each month. What yes. month was your favorite? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's something like the, the, the first chapter was energy and I love kind of the specificity and concreteness of energy. So it's things like clearing clutter and getting more sleep and like those very foundational things. But then, you know, really in the end for happiness, it all comes down to relationships. So, so you know, when I'm thinking about love, um, that was probably my favorite chapter and then it just went the, the deepest and made the big, had the deepest significance. Um, but, you know, the thing about doing your own happiness project is I only picked the things that were meaningful to me. So like all of them were my favorite in a way because that's because right, 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 right. I le left out all the things that I didn't want. <laughs> I didn't, that I was like, I don't really care I'm like, about I'll, I'll cart this. Well, and right. I love how you, yes, exactly. You gave us permission. So you tried the meditation, right. Yes. Which is blasted to all of us all the time that we yes. should meditate. We should meditate. We yes. should meditate. And you own the fact that that's not a way for you to unwind. And no. you allowed yourself to get rid of that. And I think yeah. by doing that and sharing that story, it allowed all of us to say, well, maybe mine isn't meditation, but it's something else. Yes. And I tried it. And it didn't work and that's okay. Like, thank you. Yes. No, I think that the ability to say something's not working, let me move on is really important because I think sometimes when people, when something doesn't work that a lot of people say does work, like I'm going to make a to-do list. Um, you know, people are like, well, everybody else can use that. Something's wrong with me. I should just try harder or I should feel really discouraged instead of saying like, well, many people find a to-do list a really helpful tool. I do not find it to be a helpful tool because the minute I put something on my to-do list, I don't want to do it. It's like, okay, you're like that. Many people are like that. Let's figure out how you can do it in the way that's right for you. So it's like, don't change yourself. There's nothing wrong with you. Change your circumstances, change your surroundings, change your tools. Because there's a, a lot of ways that we can reach the same aim you know, we're going to the same destination, but we can take different roads there. But I think sometimes people really lock into thinking that it, they should be able to use a tool. Just like I, I'm just like, I've tried meditation a couple times now because yeah, people yeah. keep telling me and <laughs> right. I'm like, I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. Um, and that's true for mo like getting up early and doing something that's important to you. It's like, not if you're a night person and like 30% of people are night people. And like, it's just not going to be useful for them to try to get up early and go for a run or work on their novel before work, because probably they're, they're not just, wired that way. Yeah. They're not wired that way. And that's fine. So change your schedule. Don't try to change yourself. Yeah. I love that. No. And one of the reasons why I named this podcast called take a break, it's take a break from yourself, take a break from your stories, take a break from mm -hmm. expectations and just sit with who are you? What is it bringing out in you? And is that what you want? Yes. And just allow yourself that space to say yes, no, and move from there. Right. And that's who you are. And this is what, and this brings me to the next part of you have your 12 commandments and your first one is be Gretchen. Yes. Okay. And I have borrowed that. I don't know how many times in the standpoint of be Jen. Oh, be perfect. Jen because, and I have it on a post-it note in my bathroom. So every morning, you know, like, yeah, I use my bathroom all the time. And it just reminds me to bring me home to me yes. because noise happens all day long. Yes. Right. And you start yes. pulling and, and then when I go in, I'm like, okay, be Jen. No, that, that doesn't feel good. No, I can't say yes to all these things. What am I going to say no to? And yes. I love that commandment about you. And how did you come up with 12? Like why 12? Well, you know, no, I wasn't aiming for 12. Um, okay. I just, I, but I spent months and months, I mean, probably more than a year, like adding, subtracting and being like, these two things are actually the same thing. Or, you know, this one isn't as important as the others. It's, it's a secret of adulthood. It's not a 12, it's not one of the 12 <laughs> personal commandments. Um, and so 
Um, I wasn't aiming for 12. It just ended up that like that was when I got to the number that, where I felt like if I couldn't eliminate one without losing a significant idea, but if I added any more, they were just sort of like either just an amplification or something that was of less importance and sort of didn't rise to the level of like what the 12 personal commandments were supposed to be these like big statements of kind of, you know, my biggest aims, um, they were sort of smaller. So um, it just ended up being 12. Yeah, no, I, I love it and I've copied it and it's been, a, it's just been fun and I we use it at our house. Be Jack, be Joe, yeah. be Jen, right? And and it just gives you know, a second of like, wait, okay, who am I? Take a break, who am I? How does this feel? How do I wanna respond? Yep, okay, we're good. Well, you know, it's tricky, I think, because on the one hand, we wanna accept ourselves. And the, on the other hand, we wanna expect more from ourselves. And so like, if you're gonna be Jen, that doesn't mean you want to be complacent or that you don't want to push yourself, but it also means that you want to respect like the natural limitations of your nature, not try to twist yourself into a pretzel to be somebody who you're not. And, and people keep saying like, well, how do you know the difference? And I'm like, I think you're the only one who knows if you, if you're accepting yourself or if this is really someplace where you have to expect more from yourself. I mean, it's just, right. it, it's, it's, it's hard we know. to know because of the noise you say, you can't, I think we do know. I we think know. there's yeah. the noise and we have to stop and, and, and reflect. But I think in our hearts, we do know. We do. And know. I think, which we'll talk about later, it really has to go with your tendencies too. Yes, it does. Right? Yes. So yep. all of a sudden, if you're sitting here thinking, oh, why do I feel this? And then you look at, oh, I'm a person that cares about outer or inner, right? Yep. And that helps you decide what's pulling you. Yes. Right? I do. I no, think exactly. That. I think that's exactly right. So for me, okay, so the happiness project was just fun, right? It was framework. It was every month, try something different, experiment, get curious, have like, find out what your purpose is and who you are to kind of anchor yourself home while you're trying this. And I have a tendency to be kind of a serious person. I can mm -hmm, lock and too. load on a subject and just go. So yeah. when the next book was happier at home, and the title just gives you permission, right? It's mm -hmm. kiss more, jump more, abandon self-control. Um, and my other experience with everyday life, like that title just helps you to remember like, oh, come on, like, let's have fun. That's what we're yeah. here for, right? So yeah, well, and it's funny because my next, that you say about being serious because I, um, I, I, I kind of have a killjoy nature myself. And um, my next book is about the five senses. And part of that was this, I'm like, I want to tap into that delight and that fun and that immediacy and that energy. Um, because I think for some of us, we can get like very focused on kind of what we need to do and where we're going. And yeah, the and, destination, right? I yeah, mean, the, I think that's what get, exactly, I get lost in sometimes. Exactly, exactly. And so you need to have kind of, you sort of need discipline to escape discipline. You know, like, I'm like, it's kind of goofy to schedule time to goof off, but um, if that's what you need, that's what you need. Um, yeah. Well, so. you even have a quote in one of the books as like discipline equals freedom or discipline yes. is my freedom. And I'm like, that's my statement. I have that in like my journal, okay. right? Then I like, think I know your tendency. <laughs> yeah, I think I know your tendency now just from that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's funny. So my favorite quote in um, The Happier at Home is, I am living my real life. This is it. Now is now. And if I waited to be happier, waited to have fun, waited to do the things that I know I ought to do, I might never get the chance. And I was in a car accident and I should have died and did not. And that was my awakening mm -hmm. where you jumped a career and said, this is my calling. I'm summoned to write. I'm going to go down this path. I was an autopilot. And then the car accident shook me up. And all of a sudden I thought I can die at any moment. Is mm -hmm. this how I want my obituary to read? Or is this is what I want my memories to be of how I was living my life. And so that quote in this book just reminds me, okay, listen, we're on a planet that circles a ball of fire that has moons that move the ocean, the moon that moves the ocean. And I'm worried about what? Like, let's just have fun. I mean, come on, let's get back to why we're here. Right. So, yeah, yeah, so true. No, I mean, I think a lot of times people do have a big awakening, like as you did when there's some huge event. And, and, but, and I think that the challenge is like, can we try to maintain that awareness without that kind of catalyst or even kind of like after that catalyst is 10 years in the past, you know, because, right. 
um, because I think it is important to like maintain that awareness at all times that how fleeting it all is. And I'm telling you, if you read these books, you do not have to have a car accident to get this awareness. <laughs> like the books will save you yeah. that horrific experience. So I highly recommend it. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, here's another lesson I took from the book. I realize right now I'm in the season of raising children. Mm -hmm. okay? My oldest is 15. My mm -hmm. youngest are nine. And when I looked at my house through that lens, I'm not having cocktail parties. I'm having right. 15 year olds over all the time. Right. right. And so yeah. it just allowed me to say, what do we need right now? And 10 years from now, the house gets to come back to me and it can reflect more of me. But right mm -hmm. now it needs to reflect all of us and where we're at in our stage. And that's really helped me with just making the house happier and just being more relaxed about it. No, I think that this tying and tapping into the, the season, well, this is the season of life that I'm in. And so certain things are going to be at the forefront and certain things are going to fade into the background, but that doesn't mean they're gone forever. Um, sort of similar to you, I had, I live in an apartment in New York City. And so, um, so there's not that much space. And um, I remember for years, I had a stroller by the front door, right? Because we'd have to like plop somebody into a stroller, first my older daughter, then my younger daughter. And it just, you know, it's just always looked out of place. There was no place to like put it away. It just sat there in the middle of the, of the hall. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, I just cannot wait for the day when we put that stroller away. And of course, what do I think of now with just so much nostalgia? I miss that stroller. Remember the days that we had a stroller in the hall? You know what I mean? So I think it is important, like partly so that you, you, you give up sort of the annoyance and the impatience, but also so you relish it and you think, Oh my gosh, it's so fun to have like a bunch of 15 year olds like eating me out of house and home, uh, you know, once a week or something because like that time will pass too, like with all of its pain, but then all, with all of its like joy as well. Right. And so you wanted, you don't want to feel like, well, you wished it away while it was happening. Um, right, right. One of the things that I did, I'm doing for my book of five senses um, is uh, I did an album of now where I just took up pictures of all the most ordinary things. What's in my refrigerator? What's in my pantry? What a drugstore looks like? What my, what uh, our bedroom looks like? Because I realized when I look back in the past, that's what I'm most interested in. Like I'm like I'll look. I'm not interested in like a picture of the Eiffel Tower. I'm I'm interested in the picture of like what did our living room look like in that apartment that we lived in right after we first got married? You know? Um, yeah. These ordinary so would we things. Yeah, um, no, that makes sense. We, we, them. we went to Hawaii for COVID, got lucky, mm -hmm. like jumped onto the island before they closed down and ended Ooh. up spending months there. Wow. And one of the Crushing. assignments that my son was assigned was to take photos of, so you would take a photo of Pipeline Beach and it was no humans <gasps> or the stores had the tape on the ground. So everybody was six feet apart or, right. so we had to take all of these photos of what it looked like to yes. keep a memory of, and it's, we've looked like, it's the, you know, how you get memories on your phone that pop up after yeah. so many yes. times and we looked at some of them and we're like, Oh my gosh, that's such a great idea to do because that's what, that's what you kind of want to remember is because yes. that's tangible and you get the yes. feeling and the emotion out of it. Yes. Yeah. But I think often we take pictures of like, Oh, the beautiful flower or like, right. you know, the dramatic land landmark, but then like five years later, you're like, wait, Oh, I forgot about that dress that I used to wear all the time. Like whatever happened to that? You know, it's like the ordinary things that are often the most interesting later, um, yeah. even though we're not necessarily taking pictures of them because they just feel like, oh, well, this is just my everyday life. Why would I take a picture of it? So I think it is good to remind yourself that like one day, this is all going to be a long time ago. So um, right. let's remember it. Right. We're in the business of making the good old days, right? Yeah. Like I keep the kids. We're in the business of making the good old days right now. Yeah. Exactly. So another lesson, and you're going to kind of laugh at this, that I loved from that book was, um, why don't we try to underreact to a problem for once, oh. right? So I have, you know, we, I have a, every personality you can imagine in this house and mm. we changed this into a game. So I shared the nail, nail polish story with them, right? I mm. can't even read yeah. that nail polish example without getting cringy. Like, oh my God, what? <laughs> So yeah. I turned this into a game. Like, so what happens is somebody has to say an experience and then somebody else has to say what an overreaction to that experience would be. And then another person has to say what an underreaction of that experience would be. Because we have a tendency, a few of us in our household, to get locked into a way 
and then just mm. go down that mode. So it's kind of an exercise in flexibility of, okay, if this is an option, what's the opposite option or what's another right. option, right? And so I just have to thank you for that because okay. it's been such a fun thing for us to just say, okay, what's an underreaction? Well, that's such a great idea because I think a lot of times we just act out of impulse or out, like, as you say, out of habit, like, and we don't sort of think about, well, what's the range of possibilities here? So even by kind of rehearsing that in your imagination, I bet it makes it a lot easier to uh, like behave the way you really want to behave in a situation, even one that's kind of unexpected and stressful. So that's such a great idea. It's like a pre- it's like counting to 10 only in advance, because in the moment, it's very hard to remember to count to 10 before you right. respond. You're right. like doing it. You're like preemptively doing it. That's so smart. Well, and now what has happened is if I've overreacted, they say, mom, what would an underreaction be? See, there you go. Right. <laughs> and so they have a language that's less threatening to yes. let me know, oh, okay, yeah. I was a little harsh. Let's, let's calm down a second and revisit, right? It's well, and it also lets you add a little bit of humor to it because, and that is so much diffuses bad feelings. Like it's very, it's very like advanced coping to be able to use humor. I feel like humor is the first thing that I jettison when I'm, when I'm trying to deal with a tough situation. Um, but if you can make something funny or joke about it or poke fun at yourself, or like you say, have a language of kind of like, you know, um, dialing it down, it can be so effective, um, both, yeah. for, both for the person who's, ex who's sort of reacting, because sometimes the things that people say to try to calm us down actually make us feel worse. Like, right. why don't you calm down? It's like, that doesn't make anybody calm down. <laughs> Nobody ever got calmed down by being This is me down. calm right now, okay? Yeah, you yeah, triggered me. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, but so something like, well, then what an underreaction be? That's kind of like, okay, all right, I get it. You know, you get the point um, and it's not, yeah. So I think that's, I think that's such a great idea. Yeah, no, it was fun. It was fun. So then the book Better Than Before, which I am like, since I was born, one of those people that is just chronically, how do I become better? How do I become yeah. better? How do I become better? Right. Um, yeah. I like it how you address like right away habits make up most of our day. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was even 40% of our day might be on autopilot or some statistic like yeah. that. Yeah. And, 50% of every and day right life. in the beginning. So right in the beginning of this book, you talk about the four tendencies, mm -hmm. right? And I think yes. it's so nice to introduce that right there because then all of a sudden the rest of the book allows you to have the lens to say, oh, this is how I'm looking at it. This is how I'm looking at it. And you did write a book all about the four tendencies. So we'll yeah. get into those specifically, but maybe talk about them briefly here just mm -hmm. because then everybody gets an idea of what they are. Well, yeah. So in Better Than Before, I talk about the 21 strategies we can use to make or break our habits. And sometimes people are like, well, 21 is too many. Like, give me the five big ones. But as we were saying earlier, everyone's different. And so it's good that there are a lot to choose from because then you could pick and choose the ones that are most effective for you. And as I was figuring out all the strategies, because of course, I didn't know if there were 21. I was trying to figure them out. I started noticing these patterns that for some people, certain strategies worked really, really well. But for other people, those same strategies like didn't work very well, or maybe were even counterproductive. And I was trying to understand patterns. Um, so, for instance, and I would, and I, and my sister um, calls me a happiness bully because I can sometimes get really insistent if I think there's a way for you to get happier. So I was quizzing this friend of mine about her habits, and she said to me something that like was a huge revelation. She said, "Look, the funny thing is, I know I'm happier when I exercise." And when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? And I thought, okay, well, at one time, because I'm trying to figure out how do people make and break their habits. I'm like, at right. one time for her, the habit of exercise was effortless. She never missed track practice. But at another time now she's struggling. And so what is the difference? And what I realized was that for that, I realized that there are these four tendencies, which are upholder, questioner, obliger, and rebel. And they have to do with how a person meets expectations, um, whether outer expectations like a work deadline or inner expectations like your own desire to keep a New Year's resolution or like my friend's desire to go running on her own. And depending on whether you meet or resist outer and inner expectations, that's what makes you an upholder, a questioner, a obliger, a rebel. And this was a huge revelation to me to discern this pattern because then it would explain why certain strategies like the strategy of accountability 
was incredibly important to some people, essential to some people. But for other people, it was like, they really didn't like the feeling of accountability. It didn't help them if anything it hurt. Or for some people, identity, the strategy of identity was like incredibly important. And for other people, it was like, yeah, identity matters, but it's not really identity that really moves the needle for me. And I was like, and but so this, this understanding that the four tendencies personality framework made all of that like super clear um, about why these like larger patterns of habit formation appear. And also not even just habit formation, but like how people behave in a staff meeting or how your kids respond to um, you telling them to go, you know, pick up their rooms. Um, the four tendencies are at the heart of a lot of that. Oh, definitely. I, um, I'm an upholder. I knew you <laughs> and, were. The anybody who knows that, that not a shock. My freedom. I was like, okay, she's an upholder. Yeah. So 100%. we're the same. We're yes. the same. Yes, it's an yes. unusual one though. We're the it is like 19% smallest. or something you said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah we're yeah. not, it's not a big, it's not a big one. No, I know. So when I was, when I like first started my first business and I would, you know, I, you hire people and we didn't have managers. We were so small. So you kind of gradually grow. And I tell them to do something and I, what do you, why isn't it done? Like, I was shocked that yes. they needed to like, like, what do you mean? You don't just do it. Like we just right. do things, right? Yeah. Like It's just so yeah. funny. And it's, yeah. so now I can look back. So once you learn the four tendencies and you kind of learn the difference between each, you can look back on conversations or relationships yeah. or things that you yeah. have. And you're like, oh, this is why. Yeah. Well, and I think this is one of the reasons I really like the four tendencies is I think a lot of times when there's a conflict or there's a miscommunication, people get really frustrated with each other or they take it very personally. Like, why is it that you never listen to me? Um, and when you understand the four tendencies, you're like, this is just the way some people are like, and, and, and there's a lot of people in that, in that tendency. And there's a lot of strengths to it. And it's like, my husband's a questioner and he doesn't do anything unless I tell him why, like, I have to explain why, like, pick up vanilla at the store because we need to make chocolate chip cookies for uh, a class project tomorrow or whatever it is. Like he just like for everything, he wants to know why as an upholder, I'm like, if you ask me to do it, like, I'll it's just done. assume you have a reason. Like, I don't, right. I don't, I don't even really want to get bogged down in you. <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to know not. the reason. I'll just get yeah, it done and it's here. Like, yeah, yeah. No, I assume the you're not going to ask me something that's just makes no sense. Cause you know, I know, I know you, but I don't feel like you have to explain to me, but for my husband, that's really important. Um, so should I explain the four tendencies? So I think so, because I yeah. think I, I love them. So yes. Okay. So I'll explain these briefly. Um, and I think most people know what they are. They know what people in their life are. We could do Game of Thrones characters. These are very obvious ones you know to look for. There is a quiz. If you like to take a quiz and get a report, if you go to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies, F-O-U-R tendencies, um, you can take like, it's like 11 questions. It's free, like three and a half million people have taken this quiz. Everybody like in I my say, family has. <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, we're doing okay. this. I want to see what everybody is. <laughs> I want to know who everybody in your family is. Fascinating. Okay, we'll get back to so, but So, I'll, but I'll describe them and most people know what they are from a description. Okay, so what we're looking at is how you respond to expectations, outer and inner. Um, so an upholder meets both outer and inner expectations. So they keep the New Year's resolution, they meet the work deadline without much fuss. They wanna know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. They tend to love to-do lists, scheduling. They're very focused on execution. Um, and so as you quoted it just a few minutes ago, their motto is discipline is my freedom. Then there are questioners and questioners question all, all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they're turning everything into an inner expectation. If it meets their standard for an inner expectation, they'll do it no problem. If it fails their standard, they will push back. They resist anything arbitrary, ineffective, unjustified. They tend to love research. They tend to love customization because they want to make everything very efficient. Um, so their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. And then there real quick before we go to the next one, this one, which I've learned, because they do all the research, if you question them, yes. they do not respond very well because they feel like you don't trust their research. Yes. So even though they're questioners, I have learned, do not question the questioner. <laughs> yeah, they often, even like small questions, they kind of don't like answering questions. It's ironic 
as yeah. you pointed out, but it's but it's kind of something that you notice in questioners often. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, then there are obligers, and obliger. This is the biggest tendency for both men and women. So you either are an obliger or you have many obligers in your life. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. So this is my friend on the track team. When she had the team and a coach expecting her, no problem. When she's trying to go on her own, she struggles. And so the key for obligers is if they want to meet an inner expectation, they must create a system of outer accountability. So if you want to read more, you join a book group. If you want to exercise more, you work out with a friend, you work out with a trainer, you raise money for a charity, you think of your duty to be a role model for other people. There's a lot of ways to create accountability once you realize that that is what you need. Um, they are the rock of the world um, because they are the people who are the most likely to go you know, the extra mile to meet an outer expectation. But to meet that inner expectation, they need outer accountability. So their motto is, you can count on me. And I'm counting on you to count on me. Yes. And then finally, rebel. So if obliger is the biggest tendency, rebel is the smallest tendency. Um, rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do, anything they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't tell themselves what to do. Like they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturdays because they think, well, I don't know what I'm going to feel like doing on Saturday. And just the idea that it's on the calendar is going to annoy me. Um, and, uh, and so their motto is uh, you can't make me and neither can I. <laughs> yes. um, so once you know that somebody's tendency, your own tendency or someone else's tendency, it's much easier to figure out what kind of strategies are going to work. If you know someone's an obliger, you know that that person needs outer accountability. If you know someone's a rebel, you know that giving them accountability might very well backfire. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have a, so being an upholder and having yeah, so what's rebel your family? children, right? So I have seven children. Okay. Um, so you got, you got chance. I got everything. everybody, right? Okay. I have so what, what's, how does it break? Do my the break oldest one is my rebel, which I'm like, Ooh. why can't I have the upholder be my oldest one? And then everybody would yeah. click into line from underneath them. Right. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's a challenging personality for me. And I'm a challenging personality for him because we yes. just butt yes. heads. And so finally we have this language. I said, okay, this is your rebel personality. And I understand that, but we still have to get our schoolwork done. Mm -hmm. So how do we play the game of school and still yep. keep who you are, who you are, <laughs> right? And right. that's been an ongoing conversation that probably will be for, I mean, till infinity, I guess, I don't know, but it's once I had the language and he had the language, now mm -hmm. we could kind of understand each other and it it's helped. I mean, it's definitely helped our relationship. I'm not saying he's getting anything more done that I ask, but at least we have an understanding of each other. Well, I do feel like with rebels, I feel like it's the tendency that's the most different from the other three. And I really, um, and being an upholder, we're sort of the opposite of rebels. And I felt like I learned so much by really diving into the rebel perspective and understanding the strengths and limitations of the rebel tendency, because they were sort of just the opposite of the upholder. And what I realized is a lot of times, like, we kind of get in the way of rebels. If, if everybody would just back off and like let them do their own thing in their own way in their own time, they might very well do better. And and um, but it's funny in the Four Tendencies book, uh, rebel is the smallest tendency in terms of like uh, members, but it's the longest chapter in the book because it's the one that needs the most explanation because and 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 kind of the most discussion because as you say, um, it can be challenging and because it's the most different. I think that the other tendencies have to like sort of be led through a lot of scenarios to understand like, well, you think you're being helpful. This is why what you're doing is not helping. Or you feel like this isn't the right thing to say, but this is why to a rebel, this could be a really valuable way to approach it. Because um, it, it can be challenging. I think especially in a parent-child relationship, because as a parent, you really do have to tell kids what to do a lot of the time. Um, and rebels, you can't tell a rebel what to do. So you've got to figure out how to deal with that. As a parent, yeah, yeah. As a so what we did, right? I mean, he's a sophomore this fall, right? right? And so I said, we're going to go look at colleges. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to go to one of these colleges that we look like at, did you have to decide how you're going to show up these next three years? Because you're driving that, not me. And that was just allowing yes. me to not be at the front, allow him to figure out what he wanted. And then he gets to decide how he's going to move forward. And that's where we're at right now. <laughs> so that that is one of the when people say to me like, how do you work? How do you, if, how do you 
get a rebel to do something or, or, or if you're the rebel, how do you get yourself to do something? You used one of the, the most important strategies, which is what I call information consequences choice. This is when you give the rebel the information you need, you tell them the consequences of their action or inaction and you let them choose. And the idea of choice is very, very important to rebels. They don't like being locked in, they like having a lot of choice. So what's brilliant about your approach is you're like, here are many, many choices. Maybe you see some choices you would like to choose from. Well, that's the information that you need. This is the landscape of choice. What are the consequences of your action or inaction? Well, this is what it would take to go here or to go there. Like we can look it up. Like if you want these to be your choices, then you will have to have this kind of, you know, Chris these kinds of right. credentials. It's up to you. In the end, it's what do you want? Because, and then you might, and then often with a rebel, it's like, I know you, I've seen what you can do when you make up your mind, when you know what you want, you are unstoppable. Like, I can't wait to see how you're gonna, you're gonna deal with this. Cause like, when you make up your mind, you know, you can do anything. And it's like, because in the end it is that child that has to, you cannot push a rope. Right, um, right. And information consequences choice. Here's the information you need. Let me tell you the consequences that you can affect. Your actions will have consequences. This is how it's gonna play out. We can look it up in a book. Like this is actually like, like this is not a secret, like uh, compared to many things in life, it's like, you can actually look it up a lot of these things when it comes to college applications. Right. And it's just, right. what do you want? What do you want? But I will say this about a lot of, about speaking about applying to colleges and rebels. Here's, here's some like odd patterns that I've noticed. Often rebels will only apply to one school really? because um, they want to kind of like take it or leave it. They, they want, and so that's kind of an interesting pattern or they will pick a very unusual choice. So they might apply to an international college where everybody they know is applying in the United States, or they might apply to a very, very specific program that has a really different approach. Like we don't have grades or you only have like, you know, or, you know, just some, there are some colleges that have like very, very different uh, approaches to curriculum and students. And, and they might be drawn to that because they like it, doing it in a very different way. They wanna do what they wanna do and they wanna do it in their own way. So even within something like applying for college, which seems very systematized, rebels will find ways to do it in their own ways. Yeah, no, he's, I mean, you love him. You like, like you love it. You love the variety, right? I oh, keep yeah, reminding no. myself, I love the variety. I love the different viewpoints. I love how we need that's that. another gift from a car accident is before when kids would argue, you'd be like, come on, just stop fighting. After a car accident, you're like, I get to witness two different personalities trying yeah. to defend their viewpoint. This is amazing. Like as long yeah. as we don't get mean, we're good. <laughs> you know what, you wanna know where you can see that as well is go to an office kitchen and read the signs that are posted. That is where I see the four tendencies, like that, you know, the battle. Um, it's like, who, who, how, and why is that office dishwasher gonna get loaded and unloaded or like, who cleans out the fridge? It's like, and you see all the tendencies like bringing their unique perspective to bear. It's hilarious. Oh, but you is. realize like in life, at home, at work, we need all these different people with all their different perspectives because we, we would miss something important if they weren't doing it. And yet we do have to manage sometimes the conflict and the misunderstandings that can arise. Because if you're like, I'm an upholder and I don't understand like we're all like, you know, I just saying you got to do it. It's like, why are we still talking about it? It's like, yeah. okay, because if you're a rebel, you're bringing a completely different perspective to a, a to an encounter. There's right. tremendous power in it, but um, there can be frustration too. So it's just sort of understanding where people are coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's again, I love all the books. I feel that one gave me a framework for relationships. Mm -hmm. The other ones gave me a framework for, well, and myself, right? Myself and relationships. And the other books gave me a framework for being better or having more fun or learning what I want to change or improve and allowing other things to fall away. That's such an interesting way to look at it. I never thought about that, but you're hundred percent right. On the other ones, it's all fo very focused on the self. Like what can you change? Like, what can you affect? Cause that's what I'm always about. Like, what can you do tomorrow? I'm not interested in like your endorphin level or something that you can't me measure or manage, but you're right. The four tendencies is very much like, it's just as much about other people. Right. Um, and because if you understand them, you can tailor your own actions to them. You can speak more effectively or set things up in a way to help them succeed. But you're right. The other ones are very much more like, well, how could you be happier at home? 
Um, and that might have other people might benefit because like when I change relationships change, change yeah, and yeah, when yeah, I change my, the atmosphere, of my, my household or my workplace change. Um, but you're right. The four tendencies is much more like, let's look at everybody and kind of like put them all, you know, like yeah. look at them at, like as humanity right? Um, rather right. than starting with the individual. Oh, that's an insight. I had into my own work. Thank you. I you're never welcome. thought about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, as I told you, I'm a diehard fan. I'm all things oh, you. It's so I fun. Love and it's just because Thank it's you. nice to be, you provide so much language and context and stories. So then everything is just easy to navigate with. Right. And that's, so I'm, you, you kind of mentioned briefly that you're working on a new book. There's a new one coming yes. maybe. Yes. There's a book about the five senses. I'm still, uh, thinking about the title, so I don't know the title, but it, yeah, it's about the five senses. And it's about this idea that, you know, I realize like I can get, you you know, I can be a killjoy and get stuck in my head. And I realized that I wanted to connect with the world and other people with like more vitality, more freshness, more, just more salt, more grit, you know? And, um, and that the way to it was to really focus on my five senses. And so I just uh, went through the, the big five senses, yeah. the kindergarten senses, really, paying attention to that sense and how I could bring it into my life. Um, some of the senses were already really important to me. Some of the senses, um, I didn't pay as much attention to them. And so I was able to sort of like really bring a lot more into my life by turning my attention um, right. to those senses. So yeah, it's been, oh my God, every book that I write, I'm like, it'll never be this good again. This is the most interesting book that I could possibly ever write. Like it's all downhill from here. And then the next one, I'm like, this is my favorite. I love this book. This is the greatest subject of all time. So I'm loving the five senses. Well, and it's so fun because it you're like, well, this is research, but I'm learning so much about me along the way. Absolutely. And now I can be more aware and more. Yes. And as we become more aware, I think we have the ability to be more happy because yes. we're just clued into, oh, this feels good. This is good. Or here's different ways to mellow me out or energize me to go forward. Well, Hunter, even, even the smallest things, like uh, uh, just like thinking about minor irritations in your day, like whether, like I realized, like I wrote a little book called Outer Order, Inner Calm because it's all about yeah, I love that clutter. one too. Yes. Right. But then I realized like, just like I need to clear clutter, I need to clear clatter. And I was like, there are little things that are like pinging and dinging and buzzing that I could just like, let's get rid of those, like those little noise, that clatter. And just, I don't need to hear that. So you know, turn off notifications. My, my husband's alarm clock was going off every day. Like just one day it started go going off every day at noon, which would be fine if I'm not home. But when I'm spending so much time at home, I'm like, and I would just go turn it off instead of figuring out how do you turn off the alarm so it doesn't go off every day. Every day. So right. I was like, I don't know how to do that. And then it took me like four seconds to figure out how to do that. Instead of just every day marching in there, turning it off, you know, I could just, um, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of things where you can just, well, even for they're me, they're making so, buzzes and bangs. They don't need to. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm leaving for Pakistan to climb K2 as part of one of my wow. mountains Huge. that I'm trying to climb. Huge. And I have to close my eyes sometimes and just take away the visual stimulation yes. that I'm in, in that environment and be, I'm okay. Everything's right. fine. I can feel myself breathing. I can hear my heartbeat going. We're good. And mm -hmm. sometimes when you're on the mountain, I wear these rose colored lenses. Mm. And because then when I look out, everything kind of has a pink hue and the snow looks like cotton candy mm -hmm. and you don't realize how that can shift you into a different mode until you oh. take them off and okay, this isn't nice cotton candy falling from the sky. This is blowing nasty snow right oh, now, but because I just changed the lens, I could be in a happier space for a little bit longer. Right. Or you you'll literally have rose colored glasses. Yeah, wow. no, really you do. And they're for low light. Supposedly right. it's supposed to be for different types of light, but I yeah. literally will keep the rose lens on just because it puts me in a better mood when we're in parts that are a little aggressive that can trigger, you know, my fear. And then also so the wind can blow so strong yeah. that sometimes you'll wear headphones just to dampen how strong the wind blows. And that can help you just mellow out. So I'm really excited about this book because these senses play such a role in all of our experiences. And once we recognize that, we can make everything easier. Wait, do you wear headphones because it's just so loud or because it like tears at your ears? The wind can go like <sighs> at nighttime. So then all you hear is this wind just howling. And wow. I don't know if it's 
Hollywood or life or whatever, but that wind can be a form of punishment, right? Like you, like that sound that is relentless when all of a sudden it stops, you're like, ah, but it can amp my nervous system. And so I'll put them in just so I don't hear it as aggressive and it helps me just stay calmer. And so I think this census book is going to be amazing because it, it plays into all the things we do for sure. Right. And in ways we don't even think about, right. I mean, you're, it's interesting because since you're in such an extreme situation, it kind of, it kind of, you can see it more clearly because it's so exaggerated, but I think probably for a lot of people, um, there are times where there's, there are noises outside where it's just like, uh, making, like, I know during COVID, I live in New York city and there was a period where there was a lot of sirens and I just tuned them out. I didn't even hear them, but I had a friend who was like, it was very distressing to her. Like it was right. really, really like, it was really every time she heard one, it would remind her to feel anxious. And I was like, yeah. And, and I wish I had thought to say to her, why don't you maybe wear noise canceling headphones for a little bit? Because maybe this, no, this is a sound that is just, it's like, it's making you very, like it's bringing out all this, like this cortisol. And it's, right, but not right. in a way that's, it's not helping you to do anything because really you're just supposed to stay where you are. I mean, um, I even had interesting. Yeah, yeah. I had to move a son out of a preschool class because he would come home and say the lights were singing, the lights were singing and it drove him nuts because the lights made so much noise. Have you ever been in a room when you turn on the lights and they make that noise? That flu- like fluorescent lights that kind yeah, of, um, right? uh, and he just could, it, he could not handle it and it just wired him for hours. And so yeah, this book's going to be good. I'm excited. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, well, yeah. I'm, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Good. That's the nice Yay, thing. We've had so much fun. This is so oh. good. So tell the listeners because all the ways that they can participate and learn more and all the things you. Yes. Uh, I have a website, GretchenRubin.com. And there you can learn about everything. You can read about the books and you can read excerpts and have all kinds of resources. Um, if you want to take the quiz that we talked about to find out if you're an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, a rebel, um, you can you can probably just search for Gretchen Rubin quiz, but you can also go to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies, um, F-O-U-R tendencies, and there's the quiz there and also like a lot of guides and, you know, nutshell guides and one page or some things uh, about the four tendencies. Um, I have a podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, where every week I talk about how to be happier, healthier, more productive, and more creative with my sister, Elizabeth Kraft, who, as I said, is a TV showrunner. She is the showrunner for the reboot of Fantasy Island for Fox right now. That's oh, her job. So she's fun to talk to. She's an obliger, by the way. Um, and uh, and then I'm on social media in all the usual places. And my handle is Gretchen Rubin. So YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. And you have an places. app. You have an app. And I have an app. Yes, the Happier app. And this is great for people who are working on their habits. Um, you, you can use the four tendencies to help you figure out what tools to use. Um, and go to thehappierapp.com and you can learn more. Um, you can track one, ha- one uh, aim uh, for free. And then if you want to do more, you can subscribe. But you can, there's all kinds of, there's quotations and know yourself better questions and all kinds of tips and resources there. So there's a lot going on there. We just want a Webby for that app. So that's very exciting. Um, and I love hearing questions and insights and observations from people. Like I really engage a lot. So anybody um, who uh, wants to connect, um, I really love that. I feel like the world is my research assistant. Um, I've gotten so much from engaging with people. I really appreciate uh, hearing from people. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your time. And we look forward to posting this, and letting everybody participate.